I don't know how many of you know this book. It's one of my favorite books. It's a book called A Little Engine That Could. If you haven't read the book, you should go to a bookstore and get it because it's truly inspirational. And it captures the imagination of all kinds of little boys and girls. As you can see from the cover, there's a little locomotive trying to um, actually um, go up a, a small hill. And the actual book has, uh, it's a story about small locomotives and large locomotives and the fact that the stronger and larger locomotives can actually go up the hill and the smaller ones uh, struggle. And uh, I'll come back to that. It really is related to the theme that I'm trying to get across uh, in my remarks today that are really focused on a crisis, an epidemic, if you will, that's going on in our schools, K through 12, as well as uh, in our universities and also uh, in the arena of young adults' lives. Today, I'm going to talk about two people. On the right is a young man called Brogan Dully. Brogan Dully was a 21-year-old student at the University of Cincinnati, the great institution that I was the president of until just about a year ago. Um, Brogan was somewhat shy, but was very popular, and he was quite the athlete, an accomplished swimmer, and also a coach for swimming for youth in the Turpin area of Cincinnati, Ohio. The person on the left, in contrast, wasn't a good athlete, and isn't a good athlete even today. And you can see that I'm carrying something that doesn't even exist today, a reel-to-reel, -reel, because I was on, surprise, surprise, a very nerdy audio-visual crew. <laughs> and some of you teachers know that students in the AV crew are actually pretty useful, right? Because they move equipment around and help you out. Back then, we would actually have reel-to-reel -reel movies that we would help support the, the, the teachers with. And I did that. That's a picture of me uh, when I was a high school student. So I was significantly younger than Brogan in that picture there. But even though we looked different, he was an athlete, I was not. He was probably more popular than I was. Uh, I was sort of nerdy, and he was uh, uh, really more well-rounded. Um, there's a similarity between the two of us. Brogan Dully, at the age of 21, when I was president of the University of Cincinnati, went missing one night. I think it was May 18th, 2014. He told his roommates he was going to go look for a cell phone that he had lost. And in this day of closed-circuit TV, you can actually see him leaving the apartment building, walking down a hill. He and his friends had had a fun night uh, up until that time. It's all on closed-circuit TV. And he never comes back. And so his friends get worried the next morning. They tell the university. They tell the friends. Eventually, his parents find out. The media catches on. And something absolutely amazing happens, which I think is a testimony to Cincinnati, Ohio, the University of Cincinnati, that community. If you haven't been to Cincinnati, it's sort of like a, a real hometown. It's a place where people rally together and look after a lost son or daughter. So eight days went by, eight days that will become more significant as I talk to you about this story. Eight days where thousands of people actually spanned across the entire city trying to find Brogan Dully. Well, I received a phone call from the chief of police saying that somebody had actually a landlord, landlady, uh, reported some sort of disturbance in a house not too far away from where Brogan lived. And when they went inside and went down to the basement, there was Brogan's body. He had hanged himself. And the entire community, the entire university, obviously his family, was totally grief-stricken. And one of the hardest things that you do as a president of a university or a principal of a high school or a junior high school is to have to preside over a memorial service for a student who has taken his own life. The guy on the other side, me, I tried to kill myself twice, once at the age of 14 and once in my late 20s. As you can see, my story is a different one. I'm lucky to be standing in front of you today, and indeed to be so privileged to be the president of one of the world's great universities, the University of British Columbia. So that's the story about me. Why did I try to kill myself at the age of 14? Well, I'm one of three boys. My older brother, Memoro, was a child prodigy, is an amazing concert pianist. 
and he had, at a very young age, he played with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, and he was a golden boy of music. I was the middle child. I was no prodigy. In fact, I didn't even do well in physics. And I think my parents were pretty ashamed of me. My father's a math professor, and his son didn't do very well in physics. And my younger brother, Ken, was a child prodigy in mathematics. At the age of eight, he knew that there must be no last number. Therefore, infinity was a concept that he grasped at the age of eight. And so here I was, this pretty ordinary guy, flanked by two amazing child prodigies. And I feel, felt totally inadequate and uh, um, someone who wasn't really befitting to be a member of this august family. And so uh, at the age of 14, I, one evening when my parents were watching TV, went to the fridge, never having had anything to drink, grabbed a bottle of vodka and a handful of cold medication, and I tried to take my own life at the age of 14. Thank goodness I woke up. I didn't know how much it would take to end my own life. I didn't the next day feel angry at myself. I still struggled with my mental health. For many, many years, as you know, I tried once again in my 20s to take my own life. And the second time was more serious, and thank goodness, in my late 20s, when I was already an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University, I had a chance to receive the treatment that I needed. I went to the Shepherd Pratt Hospital and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was treated with a combination of Zoloft and psychotherapy. And I started over a period of years, unbeknownst to my chairman, the dean, the president of Johns Hopkins, I worked to try to tackle the demons inside of me. And I got better. And I'm symptom-free today, thanks to them. Now, Brogan's story is very different, as you know. He was successful in taking his own life. And there's a lot of good that's happened because of what happened to him. And I want to tell you that story. And I want to tell you about how I imagine a future when fewer and fewer young students in schools and universities will advance to the stage where they take their own lives. See, there's this picture of that book, The Little Engine That Could. And I want to talk to you about it because it's a story that Brogan Dully would tell the littlest swimmers that he was coaching. You can see him with one of his protégés in that picture. And Brogan was all smiles and all encouragement. He would take those little swimmers and say, just like the little locomotives that, if you think you can, and keep saying, I think I can, I think I can, that they could be successful. What an inspiration. And that's what people remember about Brogan, including his family. Remember I said that uh, all of Cincinnati looked all over, Cincinnatians all over looked for Brogan over eight days. And what a remarkable family. Obviously, they're suffering, and they'll never stop suffering with the loss of their son. But what they did immediately, within the year after his death, was as a family, they put together an organization called the Eight Days of Greatness. If you look at that uh, uh, picture there of the nine squares, the one on the upper left-hand uh, corner are Brogan's glasses, his trademark glasses, which are actually pretty similar to mine. Surprise, surprise. And every single one of those eight days has a meaning, a virtue, an action, a value that that family believes if we all embrace those over that eight period, days of day, day period, every single year, they believe that you can build the kind of web of support needed to intervene with youngsters that are struggling with their mental health, and it's an amazing effort, and I hope it spreads all over this globe. You can see a picture there of a group of people participating in the eight days of greatness, and what's amazing is different institutions and companies would actually sponsor each of those days, and people would think about what those values mean and how, if we as a collective group embrace those actions and values, that we can save lives, the eight days of greatness. 
There's a lot more we can do. And the question is, why is this important? Well, I can tell you that I just welcomed 9,000 first-year young adults to the University of British Columbia. Incredibly brilliant students, among the most brilliant students anywhere in this world, and they are amazing, they are articulate, they are talented, there are athletes among them, there are Olympic medalists, there are probably future prime ministers in that group, but guess what? Even in that group of 9,000 people, one in five are going to struggle with mental health during their time at UBC, and UBC is nothing special. It's happening in the schools and universities around North America. Everywhere we go, this is a crisis and epidemic. That's why this conversation is important. And I want to ask all of you to be part of this imagination so that we can do something like the eight days of greatness to catch kids before they move to the point where they try to take their own lives. Now, what can be done? Well, here's an example. Here's a story that you should read. Uh, I was actually at a, a, a fundraising event to try to raise money uh, to um, create programs and essentially get the word out that, that we should destigmatize talking about mental health issues. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. The more of us who have, by the grace of God, been able to stay alive, and being able to beat the demons that are in our heads, the more we destigmatize talking about it, the more we can, as a community, take the steps that are necessary to create this web of support for our youngsters, for our kids, and for our grandkids. This is a book by Jasmine Warga, My Heart and the Other Black Holes, that tells you about the hopelessness and helplessness that rests in the hearts of youngsters, that drives that drive them towards ideating and trying to take their own lives. Read the book. It tells you a number of things. It tells you, number one, that this is a real problem. It's not somebody else's problem. It's all of our problems because I'm sure all of you would agree that you know somebody in your family or your friends' families that are dealing with mental health issues in, in, in youth and individuals that have lost loved ones through suicide. So it's our problem collectively. Now, there's a lot of things that are happening and I think there are good steps, but I imagine a day when every young person and young adult who thinks they're alone will realize that they're not the only one. So here's the organization, the Canadian Association of Mental Health, and they have a program that you should look up if you're a teacher or you know somebody who's struggling called Before Stage 4. Just like cancer, there are four stages of mental health that start with relatively mild form, number one stage to stage four, where it's incredibly serious. And we deal with uh, young adults at all four stages at the University of British Columbia, and they are in your school systems, and they are in every college and university around the world. We need to get this kind of early intervention and training for all teachers, for all parents, for all peers. We need this to get out so everybody understands that the earlier you intervene, the more likely you are to save an at-risk youth. That's one example of what's happening in Canada. In Britain, there's something even more ambitious that's going on, and we should think about this in British Columbia and in Canada. The National Health Service in Canada, in, in Britain, is actually pioneering a program where there's free counseling 24-7, whether you're in a village, whether you're in a suburb, whether you're in the inner city, where they have free primary care help for at-risk risk, uh, young adults and kids. We don't have that here in British Columbia. We don't have that here in Canada. There has been a significant investment in Canada and the United States, but we have a long way to go before really having a comprehensive web of support that will save millions of lives around the world. And I, would, I imagine and I dream that we can move towards something like that here in North America. Now, the other thing that can be done is that more people have to talk about this being normal. And one of the most amazing things that happened this year, and you probably know about it, these are amazing guys, Prince William and Prince Harry and their, their, their wife, and hopefully wife-to-be, I think. Uh, they have come into the mainstream as celebrities talking about their own mental health challenges. In doing so, they are breaking the stigma about talking about their challenges. 
If it's okay for a prince to say, I had mental health problems, then it's okay for all of us to say that we had mental health problems. And you can see here that they put together an organization. Now, one year, one year old called uh, Two Heads Together, um, one year on, so this is just an update, that shows you that with them coming forward, with people coming together in twos or threes, or hopefully millions of us coming together, that we can hopefully create that safety net for at-risk youth. So that's the kind of thing that we have to do more and more. And social media, as you know, is also something that is very powerful um, uh, with youth. And this is an example of something happened at Oxford University. We have something very similar at UBC called Thrive. These are web-based uh, uh, programs that are supported, supporting peer support uh, within our, our colleges and universities, uh, where actually at-risk youth in the institution can actually come and read about what exists in terms of services for them. In terms of um, social media, you can see that uh, if you go onto Instagram and actually type in the hashtag, hashtag depression, you can see that automatically that Instagram actually provides support for at-risk youth. It's very important because youth are on social media all the time, sometimes even when they are depressed or even if, when they are anxious. In the next slide, you can actually see um, that it's also true for Facebook. You type in depression, you can see how can we help, what are the resources that are available for you. All of this is needed together with national programs and institutional programs at universities and schools to really provide a comprehensive plan to support at-risk at youth. And here you can see that companies uh, such as Bell Canada um, have uh, a program called Let's Talk. And that's been an amazingly um, powerful program where millions of people have engaged with at-risk youth and millions of dollars have actually been raised to address this problem. So I'd like to end by saying that in addition to all of this, companies, institutions, national programs, support programs, we need you. Everybody has to talk about what's happening. We have to eliminate and dispense with the stigma of talking about mental health. And each of us have to be educated in understanding that we have to keep our eyes open, keep our eyes on our youth, shower them with love, and take, understand what it is that we can and we cannot do. Uh, and when we need to refer at-risk youth to professional counselors. And with that, I'm going to end by saying, going back to that book, The Little Engine That Could. You see, the truth of the matter is that individuals, students and young adults that are at risk of committing suicide aren't all little. Last year, we had a medical student who was an amazing hockey player at UBC, who, to the surprise of everyone, took her own, her own life. She appeared happy. She appeared popular. She was strong. She was not a little engine. But she didn't believe that she could. And as you can see, a talented athletic swimmer, and even a nerdy guy, little engines that not sure that whether they can actually Climb a mountain, come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all different ages, and they all need help. And so what's needed, my dream, what I imagine is that we all come together and we say, I think I can, I think I can. Not just for them, but if we collectively say, we think we can, we think we can, then we can create a comprehensive network to serve and protect and make sure that they stay alive. Thank you very much. Thank you.